Good morning, everybody. I'm Howard Chansky, the chair of the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Welcome to our October Grand Rounds. Uh, before we get started, uh, a couple of um, kudos. And one was passed along by Dr. Schiffman, and uh, it was a note from a patient who said, uh, what a wonderful job Dr. Bunzel did when he came to dress his left knee wound. He was professional and kind and very easy to speak with. He answered all of my questions and I appreciated his attentiveness. Uh, thank you, Eli. Um, I can add a few more. I wanna thank um, Arthur McDowell, uh, J.D. Gatto and uh, John Bartoletti for their excellent help uh, for me at the VA and at UW Medical Center over the last month. Thank you. And with that, we'll uh, start our grand rounds. And uh, today, this is a uh, blast from the past and, and perhaps uh, something about what's coming in our future. And it's a discussion of metal on metal total hip arthroplasty. And it's been organized by Dr. Arthur McDowell, one of our R4 residents who is uh, going to be doing a total joint fellowship and by uh, Dr. Paul Manor, uh, one of our total joint surgeons. Arthur. Thank you, doc Dr. Jansky. Just gonna pull up my slides now. Hello, I'm Arthur McDowell, a fourth year orthopedic surgery resident at uh, the University of Washington. Uh, thank you all for joining us. This morning, I'll be discussing metal and metal hip uh, orthoplasty for our October grand rounds. I have no disclosures. So I will be given a quick background uh, regarding this uh, device, as well as discussing the bearing surface design, the history of implants, uh, early outcomes from the uh, 1900s, as well as complications, uh, clinical presentation, including differential diagnoses uh, of some of the complications, as well as imaging uh, treatment, and uh, just a summary. So total hip arthroplasties are effective procedures that result in substantial improvement in patients' qualities of life. Uh, the volume of primary total joint arthroplasty has risen dramatically over the past several decades. Total hip arthroplasties are projected to grow uh, by approximately 176% 100, by 2040 and 659% by 2060. In terms of the bearing surface design, uh, total hip arthroplasty has gone through many iterations of designs. The common types and combinations of bearings in total hip arthroplasty include metal on polyethylene, metal on metal, ceramic on ceramic, and ceramic on polyethylene. Ceramic on polyethylene results in less polyethylene wear than metal on metal, sorry, metal on polyethylene bearings. Ceramic on polyethylene is the most commonly used bearing today. Um, however, metal and polyethylene has been attributed to having the lowest cost with the longest track record of bearing surfaces. It conventionally has a smaller head size, which leads to a higher risk of impingement. Uh, metal on metal is often more expensive than metal on polyethylene, and their newer designs have uh, larger size heads, which leads to increased range of motion before impingement. They often have smaller debris particles in comparison to the other types. As well, ceramic on ceramic has the worst mechanical properties and it's easier to fracture. However, it has the best wear properties of all bearing surfaces. In terms of the history of the implants, uh, in researching these bearings, I asked, how did we get here? There are many different surgeons and scientists that have contributed to the modern designs of surface bearings and prostheses. In 1891, German surgeon, Dr. Gluck performed the first reported attempt at an interpositional hip arthroplasty with ivory used to replace the femoral head. These ivory implants were revised and continued to be used by Dr. Sandbau of Mandalay. There are reports of over 500 handmade ivory hip replacements successfully implanted in the Burma between 1960 and 1995 by Dr. Sanbo and his successors. On the right is a radiograph demonstrating an ivory hip replacement of a 93-year-old female patient at 20 years post-implantation. 
1923, Dr. Marius Smith Peterson pioneered the mold arthroplasty procedure in Boston. The technique placed a glass mold over the femoral head to stimulate fibrocartilage metaplasia and form a smooth articular surface. However, the glass eventually broke after a few months. These short-term results were positive, and thus more durable materials were utilized. First Pyrex, then uh, Batalium was used. This was the first attempt at a surgical procedure to restore the joint instead of interposing tissue. As you can see in these images, these are uh, the x-ray of a cup arthroplasty or mold, as well as the implant uh, to the left. In 1932, Dr. Charles Venable and Dr. Walter Stuck discovered an alloy they called Vitalium. This was composed of 65% cobalt, 30% chromium, and 5% molybdenum. This was one of the first metals found to be electrically inert within body fluid at that time. This material showed no signs of corrosion or pathologic changes to bone. The material was first used in dental implants, then to make plates and screws for fracture fixation. This material was later adapted to form for femoral head prostheses. However, the history of metal on metal implants begins in 1938 with Dr. Philip Wilds of London, England. He carried out hip replacements in six patients with Stills disease. The acetabular and femoral, femoral components were made of stainless steel and were ground together to ensure an accurate fit. The cup was fixed with two screws and the femoral component was secured by a bolt, which was inserted through the femoral neck. This was attached to a plate on the lateral aspect of the femur, which can be seen in the image on the right. Next, Dr. Kenneth McKee of Norwich, England, who trained with Dr. Wiles in London and Dr. Habish of New York at uh, Hospital for Special Surgery, uh, developed prostheses in the late 1940s and experimented with dental acrylic cement for fixation. In the early 1950s, Dr. McKee continued working on his prostheses and designed a metal on metal arthroplasty. Dr. McKee's cement fix McKee Farr total hip arthroplasty was the first widely used and successful total hip replacement, which you can see on the left. This total hip arthroplasty had a Thompson stem uh, created by Dr. Thompson at the time, which was a chrome cobalt metal on metal articulation, and both the acetabular and femoral components were fixed with cement. However, this implant had a high incidence of failure, which resulted from loosening of the components. In 1965, the neck of the femoral component was recessed to reduce the impingement, which can be seen in the image on the right. So these early metal on metal implants by Wiles, the early versions of the McKee and other implants were manufactured from stainless steel. This material was associated with very high wear of the bearing surfaces with high friction and corrosion. In the early 1960s, Sir John Charlie, as seen in that image on the left, pioneered the low friction arthroplasty technique. Professor Charlie was convinced that the metal on metal articulation of the McKee was unsatisfactory. He performed experiments which demonstrated that the McKee total hip arthroplasty had a high frictional torque in, in the laboratory and predicted this would eventually loosen the fixation of the McKee component leading to failure. His first attempt in designing a total hip arthroplasty was with a Teflon on Teflon bearing, which wore out and loosened in two years. He then tried metal on Teflon with similar results. Sir Charlie then recognized that high forces on the implant was the major contributor to loosening. In searching for low friction material combinations, he found that a stainless steel ball on polytetrafluoroethylene had a coefficient of friction similar to the normal joint. He additionally decreased the femoral head size from 40 millimeters to 22 millimeters, which helped reduce the contact area and thus the frictional force. These things led to his design of an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene on metal as the bearing surface of the acetabulum demonstrated in the images uh, on the slide. This design helped pave the way for the modern implants that we use. At the same time, other metal on metal implants were continued, continued to be created. The Mueller prosthesis and the Hugler uh, were developed in the 1960s 
And in particular, the Mueller prostheses uh, had a Charlie type stem while the Hugler had a McKee type stem. They also were composed of cobalt chrome alloy, which was different from the stainless steel prostheses, arthroplasties from the past. In the early 1970s, excellent early results from the Charlie low friction arthroplasty were being reported and the use of metal on metal articulations was in decline. Until the early 1970s, only select surgeons were granted the chance to implant the Charlie prosthesis. Dr. Charlie stressed the importance of cup medialization to reduce the joint reaction forces, bony containment of the cup and correct alignment of the femoral stem. In contrast, McKee never restricted the use of his prosthesis and his surgical technique frequently resulted in unsupported cups, particularly when only one size was available and the neck uh, would have impingement. Together with the problems of irregular geometry, poor surface area, and uh, equatorial bearings of the early designs, this resulted in higher early failure rates compared to the Charlie prosthesis. McKee then stopped using his metal on metal uh, arthroplasty in the early 1970s. In terms of the advances with metal on metal, in the late 1980s, there started to be a resurgence with uh, metal on metal design with improved clearance or the adequate space between the femoral head and the acetabular articulation surface to allow fluid film lubrication and clearance of any debris from within this joint, as well as metal hardiness. And re reproducible surfaces was introduced by Sulzer Orthopedics in Switzerland. Orthopedic surgeons were becoming more interested in metal on metal articulations at the time because polyethylene wear particles were being found to contribute more to the failure of total hip replacements. Even more, Schmidt, Weber, and Schoen carried out a retrieval analysis of 30 McKee, Farr, and 24 Mueller all metal total hip replacements using a, a coordinate measuring machine they found with the total average linear wear rate of the head and socket together was 12 micrometers for the McKee far prosthesis and four micrometers for the Mueller. The average clearance was 120 and 210 respectively for each. And there were other studies that showed that there was excellent wear uh, results from these prostheses in comparison to metal on polyethylene implants at the time. Dr. Bernard Weber, in collaboration with the Sulcer brothers, began the development of a modern all-metal hip replacement using the high carbon containing cobalt chrome alloy. In comparison with the original cast cobalt chrome alloy, this new alloy had smaller carbides with a more homogeneous distribution, which offered the potential for the reduction in surface roughness and maintained high wear resistance. This led to the development of a new metessal bearing which was first implanted by Weber in the 1988. Additionally, uh, the 20 year results of Charnley and McKee Farr prostheses were further reviewed and an article in CORE that was published um, in 1996 looked at these implants. 169 patients between the year of 1975 and 1976 were reviewed from two institutions with 107 uh, implants of the McKee Farr and 70 Charnley arthroplasties were reviewed. However, a large portion of the patients were lost to death as well as follow-up uh, with five patients being unavailable for medical reasons. Uh, at the 20 year mark, uh, the aseptic probability of survival for McKee Farr was 77% and 73% for the Charnley prostheses and the osteolytic lesions were observed in association were respectively two and five for the surviving hips. In terms of other metal on metal implants, hip resurfacing was a background procedure that continued to be used over time. And throughout the years, hip resurfacing had undergone multiple changes to the bearing design. Enthusiasm for hip resurfacing waxed and waned due to data showing the 10-year revision rate approached 45%. McMinn and Bronin Tracy created the Birmingham hip resurfacing implant in the 1990s. This implant had a 92% survivorship rate at 10 years and was reported in multiple studies and joint registries. This prosthesis helped start the modern area of hip resurfacing. 
In terms of complications, between 1998 and 2008, approximately 35% of total hip arthroplasties were metal on metal in the US and Europe. There were ongoing reports of eleva elevated cobalt and chromium levels in blood, as well as adverse local tissue reactions being identified and characterized at this time. There was also grave concern for a uh, link to cancer uh, due to these metal levels and systemic toxic toxicity. Conditions associated with implant wear, not only to metal on metal at the time, uh, included pseudotumor, aseptic lymphocyte-dominated vasculitis-associated lesions, trunnionosis, taper corrosion, and metallosis. In particular, metallosis is uh, when there's excessive metal debris uh, and tissue that has stained the appearance of the joint capsule and periprosthetic tissues when grossly observed during revision surgery. This is associated usually with metal-on-metal -metal total hip arthroplasty and resurfacing. Pseudotumors uh, are clinical and imaging descriptors of a large mass which is formed in the soft tissues as a reaction to the metal debris. The pathophysiologist, uh, the pathophysiology of this tissue is a hypersensitivity to metal ions with local high wear debris. Aseptic lymphocyte dominant vasculitis associated lesions is a histologic description and is based on a scoring method for cell and tissue types present within the tissues. It's not intended to be a clinical diagnosis, however, it is often used in that way. The histopathology often shows intense lymphocyte infiltrates with destruction of the synovial surfaces and widespread necrosis and fibrin exudate. Even more due to all of these concerns, in January of 2013, the FDA published a proposed order to allow for notice and comments regarding the changes for all metal-on-metal -metal total hip implants from pre-market notification to pre-market approval. This is the most stringent regulatory category of the FDA's oversight for medical devices. A final order was published in February 2016, and the requirement for filing pre-market approvals was effective in May of 2016. Since that time, all manufacturers of metal-on-metal -metal total hip implants are required to stop marketing their devices and again submit pre-market approvals that must be approved before the devices can be marketed again. In regards to those things, the FDA has no approved metal-on-metal -metal total hip replacement devices marketed in the U.S. currently. Uh, the two FDA-approved metal-on-metal hip resurfacing devices are available, though. In terms of clinical presentation of the complications, they can be asymptomatic. However, there can also be pain and limping. And if there's concern for a pseudotumor, there can be a palpable mass uh, with abductor weakness. Additionally, there have been reports of cobaltism with uh, systemic toxicity, which can lead to fatigue, cardiopulmonary, neuroocular symptoms, and mood and behavioral changes. Like all things in arthroplasty, you have to have an astute eye to look for signs of prosthetic joint infection, as well as aseptic loosening and instability. And you also want to obtain appropriate imaging. Radiographs can be helpful, however, due to the nature of these uh, interactions of the soft tissues, a MARS MRI or metal artifact reduction sequence magnetic resonance imaging may be necessary. On T1 weighted images, uh, it will show a transudate. However, on T2, they would generally show hyperintensity as compared to muscle and maybe heterogeneous or homogeneous. The hypointense content observed in the T2 sequences may be related to the presence of necrosis or metal deposition. In terms of a general diagnosis, you have to rule out an infection. Uh, you should obtain cross-sectional imaging and if samples are taken, uh, please, uh, you should send it for pathology. Metal ion levels can be taken prior to uh, surgery to obtain a baseline whenever there is concern for uh, metal ions being elevated in the blood. Oftentimes, values greater than seven parts per billion is generally an indication for advanced imaging with an MRI. However, um, some studies conclude that cobalt-chromium ratios greater than two also can be used. 
In terms of laboratory testing, as stated, and I'll hammer at home, you should always make sure that there's not an infection and ESR and CRP may not be sensitive. For uh, the advanced, for the soft tissue reactions, uh, you could also have falsely elevated synovial white blood cell counts. And so you may consider a manual cell count of the tissues. In terms of treatment, uh, single stage revision total hip arthroplasty is usually the go-to and is indicated for painful total hips in the absence of an infection and ceramic on polyethylene is often used. In terms of metallosis in particular, a single stage can be employed. However, a second stage may be necessary after the tissue is debrided, especially if there's a pseudotumor and constraint liners may be necessary if there's severe abductor deficiency. In summary, metal on metal arthroplasty was previously a widely used bearing design. It has now uh, come to be just metal on metal hip resurfacing available in the US. And the complications of metal on metal may require revision arthroplasty in the future and is something that we as orthopedic surgeons should be aware of as we go through training and our careers. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. Um, Arthur, thank you very much. Uh, just want to check that folks can see my screen. Um, Ariane, are we good? Looks good. Great. Okay. So uh, my name is uh, Paul Manor. I'm one of the uh, joint surgeons uh, here at University of Washington. And I thought I would provide a little bit of background to uh, sort of give things a sense of um, how, how this happened and why why it's important to take a look. And, you know, um, as an arthroplasty surgeon, I find this all rather fascinating, but most orthopedic surgeons are not uh, ortho, uh, arthroplasty surgeons. And you might sort of say, well, you know, what does this have to do with me? Um, and I thought that a good way to sort of tie this in would be to look at how the FDA goes about approving a medical device and give a brief overview of that. So my disclosures are as follows getting no benefits from a commercial party, but I did use to own a medical startup uh, device. And I'm currently a voting member of the orthopedic and rehab uh, devices panel, which is part of the FDA. So every now and again, I get to go to Washington and provide a little bit of my alleged expertise. So uh, the FDA has a broad mission. On the one hand, the FDA is responsible for protecting the public health by assuring the safety, efficacy, and security of medical devices. But it's also responsible for advancing public health by helping to speed innovation and helping the public get accurate science-based information. So here's the dilemma. On the one hand, the FDA is too slow. Uh, new devices are subjected to a ridiculous level of regulation. It takes forever to get an, uh, a device through the process. And as a consequence, millions of patients are denied the benefit of life-changing technology. And at the same time, the FDA is too fast. Uh, new devices are brought to market with little or no oversight. And as a consequence, millions of patients are harmed by untested technology. And this is a consequence of the FDA being a hand in glove with manufacturers. So um, if you read about the FDA, you'll get one or the other of these opinions, and they're extremely uh, firmly felt. So um, as with uh, Dr. McDowell's talk, I'm gonna give a little bit of uh, his historical background and sort of go through how the FDA started, who is it and what, what is it that they do all day. So up until the 20th century, there were actually very few federal laws regulating the content and sale of food and drug, with one exception being a short-lived vaccine act uh, in the early 1800s. But in 1906, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt signed into law the Pure Food and Drug Act. This prohibited, under penalty of seizure of goods, the interstate transport of food that had been adulterated, and this applied similar penalties to the interstate marketing of adulterated drugs. 
1927, uh, these regulatory powers were reorganized under a new U.S. Department of Agriculture body, which was called the Food, Drug, and Insecticide Administration. They dropped the insecticide uh, issue about three years later. And by the 1930s, muckraking journalists, consumer protection groups, and federal regulators had begun to point out that there was a long list of injurious products that had been ruled permissible under the 1906 law. And these were things like uh, radioactive drinks, um, mascara that could cause blindness, and worthless cures for chronic diseases like tuberculosis and diabetes. And in 1937, over 100 people died from sulfa drugs that were mixed uh, inadvertently with a toxic solvent. And this was the catalyst for the passage the next year of the Fo Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And initially, the FDA regulated just that, food and drugs, nothing else. But as it became clear, as medical uh, care became more sophisticated, that there needed to be oversight of medical devices as well. And in 1976, the Medical Device Amendment was passed. It was intended to provide reasonable assurance of the safety and effectiveness of medical devices and created a three-class uh, classification system, went through uh, regulatory pathways for different, uh, different devices, and established a lot of post-market uh, requirements, such as registration of establishment, listing of devices, good manufacturing practices, reporting of adverse events. And in fact, it actually authorized the FDA to ban devices when needed. So then the question is, what, what actually is a medical device? And, the, and the, the definition is actually quite a bit broader than one might think. Um, it refers to an instrument, machine, implant, or the like, which is used to diagnose, treat, or prevent a disease. It affects the structure or function of the body, but it isn't a drug, meaning that it does not depend on the body activating or altering it to take effect. And it does exclude certain things like electronic medical records, administrative support, data storage, things like that. Those are not considered devices and you don't need to get approval for every new version of Epic that, that comes along, more is the pity. Um, so if you uh, have a free weekend and you'd like to take a look at this, this is where you can find it. It's uh, Title 21 in the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, if you do want to look at this, I would suggest the online version because the CFR runs about 200,000 pages and it is not easy reading. Um, so getting to the, the meat of what the FDA does, there are three classes of medical devices. Uh, class one is a low risk of injury or illness. This would be something like surgical gauze, stethoscopes, tongue depressors, the like, you know, it's not really, this is not something that's going to injure anybody. Class two is considered a moderate risk. Uh, this might be something like a new suture, a new surgical instrument. And then finally, class three is the highest level of risk. These are uh, those devices which support or sustain human life are of substantial importance or present a potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury. And this might, for example, be something like a, a new joint replacement, a pacemaker, a spinal implant, something like that. And the vast majority of implants out there are going to, or devices, I should say, excuse me, are class one or two. These are the lowest risk or moderate risk. Um, and as a consequence, those are subjected to less stringent regulatory processes than class three. Approvals are typically focused on registration, good manufacturing processes, labeling, and often don't require a whole lot of preclinical data, which makes sense. You don't really need a randomized controlled trial to check out a new, new kind of tongue depressor. By contrast, class three devices typically require a pre-market approval, but, and this is the uh, important issue, and this is why we got into the mess we did with metal on metal, Devices that are considered to have only minor differences from already approved or so-called predicate devices can be reclassified as class one or two, and as a consequence, don't require as much testing. So you've spent many weekends, months, or years on your new invention. You think it's time to get it to market. 
What next? Well, first thing you have to do is explain what you've invented. You have to verify that it's actually uh, a device and that it falls under the auspices of the uh, Centers for uh, uh, Device or uh, Radiologic Health. It's truly a device. It's not a drug or a food or something else. You have to figure out which class of device it is, and then you have to provide safety of efficacy and safety. And now we start. So uh, schematic here, just running from the top, is your product a device, yes or no? Is it going to be something that's going to be used widely? Yes or no. Now, what's a, what classification is it? Low, moderate, or high risk? And is it a completely new device? So there are five types of pre-market submission. And this is where the paperwork starts to come in. And let's go through these a little bit at a time. The first is an investigational device. Um, the key here is that it protects patients. This is essentially something where you have a new device, you think it's going to work, but you don't really have a whole lot of data on it. And your task is to collect clinical uh, safety and effectiveness information for a future marketing application. It needs to be approved by an institutional uh, review board. And essentially, this is a small, going to be a small, uh, small bore study. This is going to be something where the, the prime factor here is protection of patients. Second is a pre-market approval. This is a market uh, application for the highest level of devices. And when Dr. McDowell mentioned that the FDA now requires a pre-market approval for any new metal on metal hip, assuming that one ever shows up, this is what we're talking about here. So this requires proof of safety and effectiveness, typically through clinical trials. Um, generally, the FDA expects two double-blind randomized controlled trials for drugs, but it's a little bit different for devices, partly because of necessity. Um, surgeons and often patients can't be blinded to procedures or devices that they've used. Um, and in general, the FDA tries to take this into effect. However, um, Several authors investigating the quality of the trials uh, used on these devices have raised con concern. For example, 90% of devices were approved based on a single clinical trial. And although the majority of these were prospective, which one would hope, uh, only about three quarters were randomized. In general, the outcome assessors and data analysts were rarely, if ever, reported to be truly blinded. And this is not unique to orthopedics, it's actually uh, even worse in the cardiovascular world. And importantly, the results of these trials frequently go on, on unpublished. So in many cases, the devices are approved, but there's no actual data that a, a general public or interested clinicians can look at. The next group is a de novo uh, classification. And the idea here is that there's literally nothing else like it. Um, with appropriate supporting data, the FDA can actually take this down to uh, a moderate risk classification, uh, which oftentimes means that you can find something that's a predicate device, meaning that there's something already reasonably similar on the market. And this makes it a lot easier to get the uh, device to market. Next is a humanitarian device exemption. And the idea here is that this is something that is going to be used in a small number of patients. It's going to be used in patients who have no alternative. As a consequence, it's exempt from demonstrating effectiveness. It just has to be safe. And there has to be a reasonable expectation that it's going to help some, to some extent. And then the last classification, and the reason I left this for last, was because this is the one that's most commonly used. And the idea here is that this is a pre-market notification. It's called a 510K because this happens to be the, uh, the regulation number that it, it falls under. And the idea here is that there's substantial equivalence between the new device and something that's already on the market. Um, for example, Here's a new intermedullary nail. We're taking it to market because we think it's easier, more versatile, uh, stronger than the existing devices, but it's basically an intermedullary device. And therefore, you know, we don't have to do a, a five-year study on this to show that it's an intermedullary device. And this is helpful. Um, remember that the FDA's mandate is also to promote innovation. 
So in this case, the manufacturer wouldn't need to go through the entire process of an animal study, a laboratory study, and phase one, two, and three human studies. So how often is this used? Well, 97% of orthopedic devices go through this pathway. And to give you a sense of how many uh, implants or devices this represents, orthopedic devices represent about 20% of all devices on the market. And more than 600 new orthopedic devices are cleared or approved by the FDA for marketing in the United States every year. So this is a fairly large section of the FDA's work. It is important to know, however, that new drugs are actually held to a much more stringent standard. Um, you need at least two phase three tri trials. Um, you don't need that for a device. Um, but if you're a drug manufacturer, you can't just take a new statin and say, hey, well, it's pretty close to all the statins that are already out there, and therefore we don't need to test it. We don't need to do studies. That's a little bit different from a device where, in fact, that's exactly what you can do. So this is the problem, and this is kind of how we wound up with the metal on metal debacle, and I think why it's important to kind of have some level of concern or caution. This 510 pathway assumes that the device truly is equivalent to another already marketed device, and that assumption may not be sound. The second issue is that you can have what's called a serial predicate. A predicate means that you are basing your new device on something that's already on the market, but device A may be based on de device B, which is fine, but device B is based on devices C through F, and C through F were all based on devices G through J. So you can kind of see that it's a, it's a little bit like Topsy, it just keeps growing and growing. And we see here the provenance of one of the real disasters of the metal on metal era. This was the Depew ASR, which came out in the early 2000s. And why was it approved? Well, you can see here that it traces back more than five decades. And in fact, when you count it all up, this was based on 95 different devices, including femoral stems, including 15 different femoral heads and sleeves, and 52 different acetabular components. So the implant, new and approved, quote unquote, on the left, the ASR XL, was essentially based on three discontinued devices, the McKee Farrar, the ring hip system, and the Sivash, none of which worked particularly well, and none of which stayed on the market for any length of time. Some other issues with the 510 pathway. Well, number uh, third issue is that the new devices aren't necessarily better, but they can be substantially more expensive. An example for this that I pulled out of the vascular literature was the serocyte coil. This was used, or is used, I should say, for treatment of intracranial aneurysms. The old coils were bare platinum. The new coils were coated, uh, essentially a drug eluding stent. But the company's own study showed that there was no benefit to this. And to put this into perspective, the old coils, the bare uh, platinum ones, cost $500 a piece. The coated stents or coils cost $3,000. And the typical case of a uh, treatment of intracranial aneurysm uses seven coils. So you're talking about a substantial difference in terms of the cost to the system, to the patient, to the insurance, for no obvious benefit. And as a consequence, there's not much incentive to bring something new to the market. Uh, trials are expensive, they're time consuming, they require human studies. You're not necessarily gonna get a large group of patients that's gonna be particularly willing to try some experimental device. I certainly wouldn't do it. And as a consequence, getting a new product to market is extremely difficult. Um, an average for a new device would be one to three years for research and development in preclinical testing, five to 10 years of clinical research and development, and finally, two years minimum of post-marketing surveillance. The point being that you could take two decades to get a new product to market. Most manufacturers are simply not willing to do that. 
There are some possible fixes to this. Um, first would be mandatory post-market surveillance, which is something that the FDA requires for a pre-market uh, approval, but often isn't really done. And it might be appropriate to expand this to any new device that's brought to market that has a real potential for injury. Another possibility would be the use of registry data. And this I think is appropriate. It's used in other countries. And there's really no, no good reason why we can't do it here. Except that for both of these fixes, the question remains who pays? Is it the federal government? Is it the manufacturer? Is it the patient? Who's going to do the actual hard work? Is it going to be the FDA? Is it going to be an independent agency? Is it going to be the manufacturer? Is it going to be researchers? And that's a question that is ties into the first question of who pays. And then finally, who decides to pull a device? The FDA does have statutory authority to do so, but it's rarely exercised. More commonly, the manufacturer will pull the device from the market. But then the question becomes, you know, at what level should the device be pulled? Should you wait two years, five years, or 10 years? So I think the, uh, the point that Dr. McDowell raised of, you know, being cautious, I think makes uh, a substantial amount of sense. You can't depend on the, necessarily, on the FDA or other agencies uh, across, the, across the globe, such as the European Medical, uh, sorry, the European Medicines Agency or the UK equivalent, which is the uh, MHRA. Both of these uh, entities, in addition to the FDA, approved things like metal and metal hips. So probably the best option is to say that when an implant man, a manufacturer or a rep comes to you and says this new bearing material or implant is better than anything else, you should probably be extremely cautious or afraid. Thanks for your time and happy to entertain any questions. Everybody can either just speak up or raise your virtual hand or, or put something in the chat box. Um, thank you, Dr. Manner and Dr. McDowell. That was a, a really fantastic review. Um, one of the things I it's a it's a, something to note is that um, none of us in our department um, ever fell hook, line, and sinker for um, surface replacements or or um, metal on metal bearing um, total hip replacements and so i think it's something we can be proud of um, you know i think we all sort of thought about it we discussed it as a group i remember at the time and and uh, none of us felt that um, these um, <clears throat> would or the promise of these implants um, would be borne out in the future. We all had concerns about uh, the wear properties of the implants. Um, Paul, what do you what do you think was the reason that so many uh, and and I'm starting to see more and more of these um, fail. Um, I think the early failures we've probably already taken care of, but I think there's going to be more and more of these um, to revise in our future. What do you think was the reason that so many um, implanted so many of these devices um, around the country and locally yeah. when when um, we seem to have the insight? And uh, I don't think we're any any brighter than any of the other people putting these in. But what do you think led to such uh, rapid expansion in the use of these? Yeah, I th uh, thanks, Dr. Chansky. I think I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, the short answer is. Um, you know, it's kind of, you know, the old saw that, uh, you know, good judgment comes from experience, but experience comes from bad judgment. And, you know, I think when we were at the, you know, those of us that were and are at, uh, here at the university kind of had a little bit of a track record of looking at things that had been promised as being, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread and kind of went, hmm, that doesn't really that doesn't really sound good. And so that, you know, there's been a, a fairly nasty track record, particularly in arthroplasty of things that were, you know, kind of the latest and greatest. Um, but a lot of this is marketing and, 
you know, in every case where you had one of these disaster materials or implants, these implants were marketed as this is what you should use for your young, active, healthy, heavy patient. Exactly the person that you would not really should not be putting an untested device into. Um, but, you know, all of us, you know, want want the young, active, healthy patient. Why? Because they do well. And we're going we're not going to market hey, here's a device that's 25 years old. Um, I've been using it the whole time and I have Australian registry data. That's that's a bit of a snore. Um, what's exciting to patients as a con and as a consequence to physicians is here is something that is so cool. It's great. This is brand new. It's just off the, you know, it's just off the line. Uh, let's check out this, this new device. And I think that's, I think we... You know, I think we're all kind of guilty of that. You know, we like found something that's new and cool as opposed to something that's old and old and boring. Thank you. Hey, Paul, this is Ken Shin. Hey, Thanks Ken. for a great talk. Um, on the same veins of um, us flowing from marketing, do you find that patients also um, get into it too? Did you, oh. during this era, did you find that patients were asking for this? I find the same thing. And Patients with ACL, oh, yeah. they want the latest quad tendon or the bear implant or patients want minimally invasive stuff. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, the, you know, the internet's a wonderful thing is that in that it, it brings the world to you, but it also, you know, brings everything to you. Right. And, you know, if you were, you know, if you go by Dr. Google um, or, you know, you go by Facebook or social media, somebody is going to talk about, about, you know, they saw saw this cool doctor who gave him this brand new thing. And yeah, I mean, patients are going to come in with, you know, thinking, hey, you can do this too. Why aren't you doing the fill in the blank? So I think there is patient pressure there as well. Yeah, it seems like this is the early era of when people were really, you know, getting into internet marketing. So yes. kind of that transition period. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there, there was oh, a... It, it's, yeah. Oh, sorry, Kenny, you, I, w I want to let you finish. Oh, no, that's it. Just uh, kind of a transition from analog marketing to internet marketing around this time frame with Metal well, Metal. What, what, I, what I remember, there was a, a 2020 episode, I think, one of those, um, you know, evening, one hour, um, weekly news shows. And it was focused on Holland, Holland Amstutz and uh, a ballet dancer uh, from Manhattan that he had, I think, done bilateral surface replacements on. And he really oversold the device and, and it was billed in that show as sort of a miracle permanent hip replacement that allowed people to go back to impact activities, full range of motion. And the pressure to put those in uh, really subsequent to that television show was immense. Um, and so it was also internet marketing at the time. Um, and to be frank, there were surgeons, you know, in this area and around the country who, you know, received um, really hefty amounts of money uh, for being consultants for these companies. And there's certainly a role for that. We need orthopedic surgeons, you know, to be involved in in um, the design and, and refinement um, of, of new implants. But um, I think it was a combination of those factors, but but the, the pressure was immense. Um, and I'm sure we all had the experience of losing patients who would not take no uh, for an answer. That's a fair point. If if you're a opinion leader in orthopedics um, and you're getting paid $2 million a year to promote the ASR, you're going to promote the ASR. And, you know, I think, I think the joint world has cleaned up its act, not entirely voluntarily, but I think we have cleaned up our act a little bit. And, you know, certainly I don't, I don't trust experts nearly as much as I, d I did 20 years ago. Hey, Paul, really good talk. Um, I'm curious, you know, what what are your thoughts about some of the, you know, more subtle changes in hip hip replacement design 
with larger femoral heads with smaller poly, thinner and thinner polys and, or maybe dual mobility and some of these things and kind of a second part, like for resonance coming out in practice, what, what should be the mindset on some of these things about when, obviously if it's a brand new thing, but yeah. when, when is it maybe appropriate to start thinking about adopting something? Yeah, boy, that's a really good question. Um, you know, one of the things about the approval process that I didn't really touch on for, uh, um, issues of time, the manufacturers are allowed to make small changes without, you know, without notification. And that notification could be slight change in manufacturing process. It could be change in, in sort of, uh, oh, I don't know, um, an alloy composition. And you don't necessarily have to let anybody know about it, but those little changes can make a huge difference. Um, you know, case in point was the, you know, this is going back into history a, a bit, was the Exeter stem, um, which is a highly polished stem and which is a fantastic stem. I think Dr. Fernando still uses it on occasion. This is a 50 year old stem. It's got a ridiculously good uh, track record. But in the 80s, uh, the, the company that made the stem went from a highly polished to a merely polished finish didn't look particularly different, didn't feel particularly different, but it was a massive failure. And so even a small change in the implant can make a big difference. A lot of the issues that we see are issues where we're trying to fix some, one thing and we introduce a different problem, okay? Um, we go to a bigger head because that's better for uh, stability, but as a consequence, we wind up with that bigger head toggling on the neck of the stem and creating uh, wear debris. Um, you know, I think the the bare minimum, in my view, would be two years of published data. Five years is better. Um, you know, I don't know if Seth Leopold's on the call. He talks about 10 years. I think that's a bit, uh, I, th I think that's probably too much. I'd want to see, I would, you know, I, I don't think I ever want to be the last one to the party, but I also don't want to be the first one to the party. And, you know, it's good to be an early adopter, but I don't think you necessarily want to be the guy that's out front all the time for every case. Paul, Paul I, I want to let, I hope Dr. Leopold will um, respond, but I, I just want to say for total joints, I I think two years is almost always too early to the party. I, I don't think you we learn enough in two years, except for implants that are destined to be, you know, real disasters. And and most most implants, you know, will get through that two year mark. I think without giving definitive, um, you know, definitive without gathering definitive data one way or the other. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Uh, Carlo, uh, looks like you've got a, a question or your hands raised. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. The, the one thing I didn't hear mentioned, I may have missed it, when you're talking about the various pressures to adopt new technologies is my experience as a reviewer for some of, you know, for these are very legitimate journals. These are the, uh, you know, the, the, the journals that we are presumably supposed to trust the most when making decisions scientifically is that uh, even as a reviewer, I felt pressured to, um, let's say, uh, uh, interpret or allow an interpretation of the data that was far more optimistic than the data actually, uh, than the data presented would actually allow. And, uh, you know, it, it, it happened a couple of times. I'm not going to get into details because we don't have time. It has to do with uh, spinal arthroplasty <clears throat> and uh, certainly opened my eyes quite a bit in terms of, you know, whether you can really trust the peer review process. Yeah, boy. Um... Uh, you know, putting on my editor hat for, for a minute, um, you know, that's partly my job as an editor is to, you know, kind of scale back the, um, you, you know, sort of the, the claims of the author. I mean, the, you know, authors aren't necessarily doing this, um, you know, sort of maliciously, but, you know, you spent two years on a study or, you know, you're kind of enthusiastic about, uh, about the results and you sort of, expand your results and kind of, and extrapolate that, you know, Hey, this thing worked in this set of patients. It's going to work in every patient. 
I mean, that's kind of our job as editors just to kind of scale that back and say, yeah, nah, nah, hang on there uh, just a minute. Um, it's it's not quite as good as you think it's as you say it is. And hopefully we do a better job of that than we used to. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that we do. Yeah, the problem becomes when the editors are kind of buddies with the, with yeah. the authors and they're kind of, and so they're the ones doing the pressuring is the problem. Yeah. Certainly the authors are, but if the editors are in cahoots and and I have some pretty egregious examples, which I won't share in this forum, but uh, but anyways, that's just to open people's eyes and as to whether you can really trust the, yeah. the literature, especially when results are, you know, sort of borderline. Yeah. Read the actual results. Don't read the interpretation. Yeah, that was exactly the that was exactly the case. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, we can all get on with our with our day. Um, thank you, Dr. McDowell. Thank you, Dr. Manor. That was really a wonderful uh, review. Okay. Thanks very much, guys. Have a good day, Appreciate everybody. It.